On today's show, we're going to make a unique woven panel rolling hamper because my unmentionables are worth it. Hit it! My wife, Nicole, very rarely asks me to build anything, so when she does, I like to jump on it and get it done as soon as possible. So she requested a hamper that had more capacity than the one we have now. It seems like we just have too many clothes, especially with a kid and one on the way. Uh, it's only going to get worse from here. So she requested a double capacity hamper, one that she can roll around from the bathroom to the laundry room, one that breathes well, and of course, it should look good too. And this is what I came up with. Let me give you the tour. The unit rolls around, it has four casters on the bottom. The panels are this woven structure here where we have eighth inch thick stock in these strips, vertical pieces that they weave between. Uh, it's all solid walnut and the front has the weave pattern as well as the sides. The back panel is just a simple plywood panel. Now the top is hinged and I used Rockler's torsion hinges for that because they're nice and that they kind of stay open so it's very child friendly and safe. Inside, we've got two bags that are held in place with snaps. Generally speaking, we probably won't remove these bags, but there's enough snaps to make sure it's secure. If there's a lot of laundry in here, you could just take the laundry out or you can unsnap it, use a little cinch here, and take the laundry bag wherever you need to go. Either way, it's going to work pretty well. Now, although I've got the finished product sitting here and obviously everything worked out, when I started this project, I wasn't 100% sure how all of this would go. I've never done this woven slat pattern. I didn't know if the wood would handle it well, and I didn't know if I can get the whole thing assembled. So I did struggle through it. It turned out great, but because of that unknown factor, I like to make things as simple as possible on the joinery tasks I know how to do. So I use the domino to get the primary joinery done. You certainly could substitute uh, dowels. You could use traditional mortise and tenons, and the previous project that we just did, the outdoor sitting bench goes over all the details you would need to know to replace these dominoes with mortise and tendons. So by doing that, that was one thing I didn't have to worry about and I could focus on all of the unknown aspects of this project that allowed me to experiment a little bit and save some time. All right, so uh, we're gonna get into the build right now, but uh, just one word of warning, because this has wheels on it, it is not a toy. Do not ride around on it. Do not encourage children to go inside it and ride around on it. Uh, it's just not a good idea. Don't do it, people. You see this amazing pile of walnut offcuts? Those came from my recent sculpted rocker project that we did in the guild, and it's the perfect pile of material to pilfer for this project. I had to cut down a lot of 8 quarter stock to make 4 quarter frame parts. You might think that's wasteful, but nothing's more wasteful than a board sitting on my shop floor unused. The legs on this piece are an inch and three quarters thick, so the eight quarter stock was perfect. Everything is cut to length at the chop saw, using a stop block for repetitive cuts. The center divider will be cut to length after we do some dry assembly, so set that aside for now. I'll be using the Festool Domino for the main joints. The Domino comes in two flavors, the 500 and the 700. For this job, I'll be using the smaller 500. 8x50mm tenons should work nicely. The wide bottom rails will receive two tenons, and the narrow top rails will receive one. Simple reference lines give me all the info I need, and from there it's just point and shoot. You're looking at 60 mortises cut in just 10 minutes. Now I like to glue my tenons into the rails ahead of time just to make things easier later. And it's time for a dry assembly. Now with the basic framework done, we could start to focus in on some of those cool details that make this piece unique. And one of those is going to involve this center divider that's going to divide the whole thing into two compartments. Now we could attach this to the front and back rails using the dominoes, uh, but I want to do something a little bit more fun. This is going to be a visible joint, so it might be cool to do a sliding dovetail. Now, if you've never seen one of those before, all it really takes is a single router bit to do the job, and we'll use the router table. But first, we need to measure for this piece. Now I know the dovetail based on the 
bit uh, and the size that I'm working with is going to go in a half inch into each piece. So I need to cut my center piece at this point, the distance between the front and back rails, and then add a total of an inch. And just a quick tip here, even though this piece is going to go in the center, take your measurements from the side where you're closest to your joinery, because here we can actually have some movement and things can bow out. All right, so let's uh, take our measurement right over here and make the cut. Don't forget to add an inch. The front and back rails of the hamper will receive the dovetail slot, so I simply mark the center point on both boards. At the table saw, make a single pass right down the center of the rails. This will reduce the amount of stock the router bit has to remove. At the router table, attach a sacrificial fence to the miter gauge using double stick tape. With the bit set to exactly a half inch in height, make a cut right through the sacrificial fence. And this is really the secret sauce for this process, because it gives us vital information about the location and the path of the bit. By marking the center point of the cutout, we now have a perfect index line for lining up the center lines of our rails. Because there's a lot of forces at play here, it's essential that we clamp the workpiece to the miter gauge before making the cut. Two clamps should do the trick. The second rail is cut the same way. Now for the center divider, we'll use the same bit at the same height, only now we'll use the fence and a backer board, which will allow us to run the piece vertically. The only way I know to get this perfect is to run a test piece first. After several rounds of test cuts and fence moves, I can safely run my center divider. Now the backer board serves two very important functions. It keeps the workpiece balanced in what would otherwise be a very awkward cut, and it also backs up the wood fibers preventing tear out. Keep in mind that if the fit is tight now, it'll be nearly impossible to assemble when the glue is added and the fibers swell, so adjust the fit accordingly. So now things are about to get really interesting because these weaved panels, not really sure how it's going to pan out. We're going to have one in the front and one on each side. The back is just going to be a flat panel, no need for the weaved pattern there. So I've got this idea in my head, I think it's going to work, but I don't really know for sure. So you'll sort of come along for the ride and we'll make adjustments as we go. But here's the basic foundation. We're going to have four pieces, vertical pieces, that'll be a quarter inch thick. They'll go into mortises in the top and bottom rails. That's kind of the backbone, that's the real strength behind the panel. Then we'll weave in eighth inch thick pieces that will go in and out of those vertical pieces. Uh, so we'll need a groove in the sides of our legs here so those pieces can terminate and go into that groove. That's actually one of the things that I'm most stressed about. I don't know for sure how that's really going to pan out. All right, so we've got to cut some mortises, we've got to cut some vertical pieces, some strips at eighth of an inch, uh, and then we also have that groove to cut on the inside of the legs. Let's get to it. The center of the rails corresponds to the center of the leg groove, so I'll mark those out on the top of each leg. And while still assembled, mark the locations of the top and the bottom rails on each leg. This is a stopped groove, so I mark the start and stop points of the 3 16th straight bit right on the router table itself. The workpiece is then carefully dropped onto the bit, being careful to line up the line on the leg with the line on the table. Plow the groove until the other line matches up with the line on the table and carefully lift the workpiece off the bit. The rear legs only receive one groove, and the front legs receive two grooves. Remember, the back panel will be made from quarter-inch plywood, so let's cut that groove while we're here at the router table since the process is pretty similar. For this, I'll use a quarter-inch bit that's made specifically for undersized plywood. Only the rear legs receive this groove. The top and bottom back rails also need a groove for the plywood back, so you can use the router table or consider making two passes at the table saw. We haven't talked much about the lid, but the grooves are very similar to what we did for the back panel, so we may as well cut those now too. Keep in mind, the long rails have two start and stop points because of that center divider. Now with another dry assembly, I can take measurements for the panels. Don't forget to add the appropriate amount to account for the depth of your grooves. I have plenty of material in this 4x8 sheet of quarter inch plywood for both the back panel and the two top panels. I rip at the table saw and then use a circular saw to cross cut to final length. And now for a test fit. The lid looks perfect, now for the back panel. Looking good. 
Now I've got the entire assembly upside down now because we need to talk about that bottom panel. Right? Basically you're going to measure to size, account for the fact that we'll be cutting some grooves in these rails and it will sit in those grooves and we'll notch the corners to go around the legs. The real important thing to think about here is the casters. Now, if you're gonna have a rolling hamper like me, you need to have that bottom panel up high enough to allow this wheel to sit in here. And we have to make sure this thing doesn't rub on the ground. Or if you change from, let's say, a hard surface to a soft carpet surface, you have enough clearance for it to do that. So I think about a half inch is enough. So with a two and a half inch wheel, the total height is two and a half inches, I'm gonna place my bottom panel up two inches and that's going to give me a half inch of exposed wheel that should allow me to get over various different terrains in the house. All right, let's get to it. The half inch Baltic birch panel is cut to size using a circular saw. The corners are marked and then notched at the bandsaw. Now we can use the dado stack at the table saw to cut the grooves in the bottom rails. I use special shims to get the stack to the exact dimension that I need. You'll notice that this cut goes into one of my tenons. That's okay, it'll still be strong enough for the job. With the test fit looking good, we can finally move on to our weave elements. First, we need to cut mortises for the quarter inch thick vertical components. I'm using the hollow chisel mortiser since it makes perfect square ended mortises. I usually make my mortises with the router, but you can see just how handy this tool can be as it drills a hole while chiseling the hole perfectly square. Because the wood can sometimes push the chisel away, I skip to the end of the mortise and then plunge right to the pencil line. Having wood on all sides of the chisel helps ensure that it plunges straight down. I can then clean out the remaining material. The side rails receive two mortises and the front rails receive four mortises. The mortiser can leave excess material at the bottom of the mortise, and that's easily removed with a chisel. The vertical slats are cut to a quarter inch in thickness, but I use the drum sander to really dial it in. Now that we have our mortises cut, it's easy to size these pieces to perfection. For the horizontal strips, I mill some eight quarter stock to exactly an inch and three quarters thick. Keep these pieces oversized in length since we'll cut them to final dimension later. At the bandsaw, I begin slicing the boards to create eighth inch thick strips. After each cut, I take a light cleanup pass on the joiner and then cut again. You need 11 long strips for the front and 22 short strips for the sides. For the final thickness, 1 eighth of an inch will work, but if you go slightly thinner, it'll make it a bit easier to weave these pieces for the panel. Now before we can actually do a test assembly using our strips here, we need to cut them to their final length. It's pretty easy to do, just take one of the rails, put the vertical pieces in place, and weave one of these pieces in and give it about a quarter inch extra on each side, and that should get you pretty close to the final length. Alright, so now for the nerve wracking part, let's see if we can't get this thing to actually weave together into a panel. I'm sure there are a couple different ways you could approach this assembly, but I'm going to do the method that seems to make the most sense to me. Wish me luck. I'll begin by doing a dry assembly with both rails and both legs. For extra support, I'll clamp one leg to the assembly table and remove the other leg. The only reason I attached the second leg was to get everything aligned properly. From the open side, I begin weaving the eighth inch strips in. It's a little awkward at first, but you quickly get the hang of it. I found that rocking the piece back and forth made it easier to maneuver into the groove. Now I do want a little spacing between each piece, and a Wood Whisperer sticker seems to work just fine. The second strip goes in the same way, being careful to alternate the over-under pattern. As you can see, this is very repetitive, so ding, 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 and ding. The last one can be a little tricky, so you'll need to unclamp the panel to make sure that it's captured into the groove. All right, well that was fairly uneventful so far. All right, we still have the challenge of putting this other leg on here. Now the tendons will line up just fine, but what about that groove that holds these pieces? Look what's going on here. We've got one up, one down, one up, one down. So how do we get all of those to line into the groove as we tap our leg in place? Well, the one thing I was thinking we could do is use calls. If we have a call on each side, we could sandwich these two together so they're all mostly aligned and they should slide into that groove, hopefully. In theory, all right, let's, uh, let's see if we can make it work. 
A quick clamp holds the calls in place and allows for any adjustment in the strips. And now we can add one clamp from the top and one clamp from the bottom. These clamps will hold the calls in place, allowing me to remove the quick clamp and giving me room for the leg to drop in place. As these come together, you start to see the reason for that little hairline gap between each one of the pieces. If that gap wasn't there, uh, inevitably these pieces would sit one on top of the other, and as you apply pressure like this, you probably wind up cracking them. Um, just make sure you have the clearance you need for each one of these. Once you have your clamps on the outside, then you can bring the leg in place here. Now as I get real close, I notice that I've got a little bit too much of a mismatch in the middle. So one more clamp here, one that I wouldn't be able to put on until the leg is already on here. That should do the trick. And there we go. 